everyone. Uh, yeah. Welcome to uh, our noon event in the equity series today. Hopefully you will also be joining us uh, at the end of the day for the talk by uh, Christopher Willoughby. Uh, but today we are very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Walker, um, who is the Beverly and Richard Fink Professor in the Liberal Arts uh, and Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Um, his research uh, examines stratification, social control, punishment, social psychology, which he translates into different studies of race relations, carceral patterns of inequality, identities, emotions, and time. Um, Dr. Walker is the recent author of a fantastic book, Indefinite, Doing Time in Jail, which won the Society, of Symbolic, the Society for the Study of Symbolic Interactionisms, uh, the, the Cooley Award, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's you know, been heralded as a transformative ethnography of social life in a modern county jail. Um, conducted while Dr. Walker himself was incarcerated. Um, it it is a, has won, as I said, numerous awards, um, and we look forward to hearing more about work from that book and some new work that Michael is doing uh, examining questions of social control and systems of punishment. So, All right, thank you very much. So one, one quick note, we, um, this, I usually use Apple Keynote, so we transferred into PowerPoint. I don't know how PowerPoint is going to behave with the slides. There's not a ton of things moving around, but I try to use the slides as a way of sort of illustrating what's going on. So we'll see how it goes. Um, and then I'll be sort of operating. You'll, normally I try not to look down, but you'll just have to just accept the fact that I won't be looking at you the whole time because I don't, <laughs> I got to find the keyboard sometimes too. So I want to have me sort of, you know, and thank you so much, uh, Amy, also for, for you know, that introduction, just for you all having me out. Um, so this particular image here, I have to make sure you see the same image I have because I have, I have something different here. But this image is um, of a cell similar to, it's not the exact same cell that I was ever in, um, but you know, in many regards, one jail cell is very, you know, not totally dissimilar from another. In this particular time, my celly, another way of saying cellmate, Scott, he was on the top bunk and it was close to maybe 2.30 in the morning and he woke up and he was just kind of, you know, he was sweating. And our cells are always cold, so for him to be sweating, I knew he was, you know, having a rough night. And he wakes up and he says, man, I was going through it last night. And I didn't have to ask him what he meant by he was going through it last night. I knew what it meant. I sort of understood it in my own body. 2.30, maybe about an hour and a half, two hours from then, we were going to have breakfast. So I hadn't slept at all, so I had no reason to even bother to try to go to sleep. So I hadn't slept. He woke up in, you know, with, with bad sleep. So he says to me, man, he's, he's hopping off the bunk. And he's putting on his county oranges. He's like, man, this makes me not even want to go to sleep in here. And I understood that, you know, again, sort of intuitively. A year before that conversation, I was a first generation college graduate student, um, first, first generation college grad period, and a single father, and looking for ways. We were just looking for you, Andrea. I'll just mess with you. <laughs> um, this is what happens when you come late and we know your name. <laughs> But um, so a year before that, I was a first generation college grad and, um, and also a single father. And, and I was dealing with sort of two worlds where I, in one world I was about to start graduate school. And in many regards, there was a lot of promise. I remember feeling as if I'm going to be all right, like I'm kind of making it. And I remember also thinking there's a lot of pressure. Right? I really do need to make it. Not I'm just going to, but I really have to kind of make it. But I was also sort of dealing with a depression that I thought, well, I kind of thought I was too tall, too black, and too masculine to have. I just didn't know anybody who had depression. The way that I understood depression at the time was like, yo, you're just sad. Or if I had more money, then I would be better off. Or I had more women, I'd have been better off. If I had named the thing, right, if I just get an A on this paper, I'd be better off. But, you know, this is not the nature of depression, right? I didn't understand sort of the physiological changes that one goes through under real clinical depression. But I also didn't have anybody that I could go talk to about that. I didn't have anyone that I could go to explain this is how, this, these are the kinds of challenges I'm facing in graduate school. These are the kinds of challenges I'm facing in graduate school as a single parent um, and also dealing with these other, these sort of, these, mental, these mood disorders. So for a while though, I tried to just sort of balance them all out. But when it became difficult to balance these things out, I became, I was arrested on the very first, like maybe a week before my first week of graduate school. And I kind of thought like, this is a one-off, it's not that big a deal. And I remember thinking, I remember being in the back of the squad car. I remember everything about this day in particular, but this one thought in particular stands out to me. It's just thinking, man, I'm in my late 20s. 
Like statistically, I'm too old to be getting arrested for the first time. I had had many interactions with the police, right? I've been pulled over more times than I can remember, but I had never been arrested for anything. I remember thinking like, man, I'm just too old for this. To be, it's too late for this to be the onset. Um, so I, you know, I, I spend a night, a better part of a night in jail. Um, I bail out, I get home, I start week, start school a week later. Now I've got court cases to go to though. So I'm going to court, I'm going to seminar. I'm going to court, I'm going to seminar. And I told one of the professors in my department, Scott Brooks, who turns out to be a, a cousin by marriage, um, which is just how small the world of academia is, and there's not that many black folk in academia, so we're probably all related in one way or another. <laughs> and so he tells me, yo, you should write about this. And I had no interest in writing about this. At the time, I was trying to date this Ethiopian woman who told me, yeah, my brothers can date whoever they want, but I, as an Ethiopian woman, cannot date just an average black American man. You can forget it. And I was trying to understand that sociologically. So I was interested in doing a study of like, like I knew a lot of Nigerian women, I had a lot of Caribbean uh, friends, and I was like trying to understand the differences in gender roles and who could go date who. I was interested in that. I had no interest in crime, punishment, let alone anything with jails. So writing about that night that I spent in jail was just something just to do because Scott Brooks said to do it, but not because I was planning on doing a study. I finished my first year of graduate school without further issues. I still was a father, I still did all the things I was doing. And then at the start of the next year though, man, I got arrested twice more. And this time I'm going to court all the time. It felt like I was, it felt like that's all that I was doing was going to court. If you've never gone to a criminal court case, particularly one that's related to you, it is one of the most draining experiences that you'll ever have. It's the idea that you know your life is constantly in the balance and what are you supposed to do next? Everything sort of becomes very present for you, right? You have this inability to sort of think about where the future is because your future is in someone else's hands, and you understand that. So I spent a lot of time being stressed out. At this point, depression started just kind of rages out of control, and I don't remember a lot of the details. I had to talk with my, my son, who's now grown, talk to him about like, what he remembers during this time. And you know, him being relatively young, he doesn't remember that much, that much either. But there's these moments where I'm like, I don't remember like, what my life looked like during this time. I just remember depression just being out of control. I had a suicide attempt. I survived the suicide attempt, obviously. I was picked up by police. They, were, they took me to a, a psych ward for 72 hours. Now, during that 72 hours, really what that sort of amounts to, if you've never been picked up, hopefully you never had to be picked up on a 5150 call. But it, in essence, this is this, we're going to hold you someplace for 72 hours and just see what happens to you. And hopefully, if you're fine, you, you come out. And if you're not, then something else. We'll see what we do next. I come home. There's no treatment. There's no nothing, right? So there's this just, you're out. All right, good. You're not going to hurt yourself. I go back. I still have my son with me. I still got to go through grad school. I still got to do classes. I still got to go to court. I keep trying to sort of maintain these things. Then I get, because I had been arrested one of the times on university campus property, even though it had nothing to do with the university, now that triggers an, an investigation from the university. So I've got the criminal court cases. I've got seminar classes I'm going to. I've got my son. I've got my own life that I'm trying to maintain. I've got issues happening with my family. If you're a first generation college grad, oftentimes you're bringing your whole family with you as you're trying to be successful. And then I've got judicial affairs from the university and getting involved with what's happening with my life. So I'm supposed to meet with Judicial Affairs on February 7th, 2008. I was going to turn 31 that day. And I had spent some time in my little campus apartment, and I was like trying to sow a good seed in the universe. I decided I was going to go out and go down to the courthouse and pay some traffic fines I knew I had. I was like, this would be a way of like doing something good, and then something good will come back to me later on this afternoon when I have this meeting with Judicial Affairs. Well, one of the warrants that had been issued for me had been reissued, and with charges being updated. So when I went down to court, all they did was just arrest me. So I just delivered myself to, to jail. That was too much that particular day. I remember thinking, man, I came down here for to do a good thing. I come, I'd come down here specifically to put myself in a better position. At this point, I had already started going to get treatment and I started sort of feeling capable. Started feeling it to our conversation last night. I was feeling capable, like I can sort of do things. And so I knew my life, I was more aware of just how bad things were, had gone in my life, how, how terribly off track things had gone, but I was feeling like I could do it. That particular day, I, I, I kind of gave that up. I go to court, I go to the, uh, to the intake center, and one of the deputies is at a, a, so what they do is they make you stand at a desk like this. The desk is in front of you, it's about this height, 
They, they make you, they want your palms out, spread your legs. If you don't spread your legs, they kick your legs apart. At this point, you don't have a belt on, you don't have, you know, so your pants will fall down. There's, there's all kinds of issues around this. And the deputy is just filling out the paperwork. And he says to me, um, as he's filling everything out, he's just checking boxes. And I, I don't know, so if you know me personally, you know this is something I would say. So I looked, <laughs> I looked down at the form and I was like, yeah, you should have checked that box. And so the, the box that says, no history of mental health or mental illness. So then he stops and he looks at me and he asks me, do I think I'm gonna hurt anybody? And I just said, man, I don't know what I might do. But I said it like looking him in the eye, but I really wasn't gonna do anything, right? But I was also just in a moment of frustration, like this is not where I'm supposed to be right now in this moment. And now I've got to scramble, like once, like after hours go by and I finally get an opportunity to make a phone call, now I've got to call somebody and hopefully they'll pick my son up from school. Hopefully things will be okay with him, hopefully. In the meantime, I'm still also dealing with this. And so I go through the process. He didn't say anything else to me. He just kind of stands back and looks at me. Then another deputy sort of appears at my side and es uh, escorts me around the corner. He's like, all right, strip naked. In this particular county jail, I had never been, I had been there before and I had never been stripped naked before. So I, had, I knew this wasn't the normal process. I, I wasn't expecting this. I was expecting to get in line. There's, you know, there's a line that's painted along the wall about two feet from the wall. And you're supposed to walk up within that line. Your shoulders kind of touch the wall and you keep, you know, you keep your hands behind your back, what I call the penal posture. You get used to doing it after a little while. And instead he took me to this little room. He's like, I right, strip naked. He hands me this heavy green sort of nylon dress. It's a sort of like a safety clothing that they put people in when they're about to put them in a safety cell or a suicide cell. So he doesn't say anything and I'm not arguing, I'm calm. I'm not upset, I'm not hollering and screaming or nothing like that. I'm just, I'm just kind of zombieing with him as he goes. So he issue, uh, ushers me into this room. He puts me in this room, he closes the door. It takes me a little while, but after I, after I sort of, my senses sort of come to, I have this moment of realizing like, okay, I'm in this room and there is human excrement like all over the entire room. On the, in the upper left hand corner, there's a camera, there's you know, human excrement on that. And the, the lighting fixture above me, there's human excrement on that. The floors beneath my feet are soft epoxy and kind of, you know, and there's excrement in, in the spot I'm standing in. I turn behind me in the door, there's excrement on the window in the door, on the door itself on the wall right here to my right, on the wall right here to my left, and then the corner going over here. There's excrement everywhere, and there's human, uh, dry, there's dried urine everywhere. The floor slopes to the right-hand corner. There's a grate on the floor that's kind of torn up a little bit, and there's human excrement and, and, and dried urine over there. And it's just, that's it, that's what's in the room, me and all of that stuff. I stay in that room for what I assume had to be 72 hours. It took me a minute to figure out like why I was even in there. But I remember thinking, I'm in this other place. Now the, the jail is in the heart of the city, but when you're in jail, you feel like you are thousands upon thousands of miles away from anywhere. It's like going through the, you know, the, the wardrobe at the, the Chronicles of Narnia, but coming out in a really bad place, right? No, no happy lion waiting to talk to you about anything. So I have another suicide attempt in, the jail, in that cell. I have, I go for you know, what, is, what amounts to is nearly losing my mind in that moment. Um, and I have, I'm visited by this sort of younger uh, Korean-American uh, worker from the Department of Mental Health. She's reading a survey at me. She goes through the survey items. She realizes that one or two of the survey items don't have anything to do with me. Do with me. So she starts and then she restarts, starts, starts, stops, like, oh, okay, yeah, actually not this. And then finally I just, because this is, what else am I supposed to do in this moment? I just ask her like, yo, are you trying to help me or are you trying to read questions at me? And she's like, well, I'm trying to help you. And so she reads another couple of questions. She realizes this ain't going anywhere. She stops, she says, you know what? It doesn't matter. And she closes the latch and she leaves. Some hours later, I have to assume it's a day, another older black woman comes and I describe her as having sort of like auntie energy. And so she shows up, she said, you know, she's like almost, she doesn't say this, but it feels like she's like, baby, you okay? And that's how she comes off to me. Like, are you all right? And she's like, do you want to get out of here? And I say, yes, absolutely. And she's like, all right, well, the doctor's going to come. And when he comes, all you got to do is tell him that you, that you feel better and you want to get out of here. That's it. Not someone's going to come talk to you about how you got here, what you're going through. Not, you know, what are you experiencing right now? Not, not, no analysis. Just tell this doctor when he or she comes that you want to get out and you'll, you better get out. A day or so later, a little Indian man shows up. And he's got this real positive affect. He just seems happy, right, to be there. He opens the door. He's smiling. So I smile. He seems happy, so I seem happy. And so he says, do you want to get out of here? How do you feel? And I was like, yeah, I want to live. I want to get out of here. I, absolutely, I'm happy to get out of here. 
He's like, okay, we'll get you out of here. And then that's it. Like a couple hours later, a deputy shows up, escorts me out of there, escorts me to a little area where I rinse off really, really quickly, and they put me in my county oranges. That's it. There's no follow-up. There's no discussion. As we're walking to the little shower area, I realize that there's these cameras pointing into the room. They can see everything. So they saw all of what I went through during the 72 hours where I was there. No one ever stopped to see. No one said, hey, man, he's in there trying to kill himself. Or, hey, he seems like he's going through something in this moment. Let's go in. There was none of that. There was no treatment, right? But I understood this is what treatment looks like, mental health treatment in this particular jail. In all, in all I end up having it to do about 134 days. That's right. You all need to see this, huh? There it is. All right. That's not how it does in keynote, by the way, but whatever. And, all, and so I get out. I, at this point, I surrender. I give up. I don't want to go to court anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. And my public defender says, all right, they're looking at three years. And I say, give me three years. He says, all right, hold on, hold on. I can't just have you accept three years. Let me go back. So he goes back twice more. He goes from three years to 240 days to 180 days. I accept 180. I accepted all of those. But he, he fought, I guess. Or maybe he was, I have no idea what he was doing. Like, why come tell me when I say yes? Then he goes back, you know, whatever. But in the end, I get a 180-day sentence. I have to do 120 of them consecutively. And in total, I did 134 days in the county jail in Southern California. When I first got there, he told me, uh, you only, you'll probably get out in three days. You have a nonviolent charge. The jail's making room for people who have violent charges. Don't worry. So that's the first thing I told everybody. I ain't going to be here for very long. Don't look, you know, don't look for me. And people laughed. I remember one guy saying, yeah, I was told that four years ago. I'm still here. My case has yet to be adjudicated. By the way, no one had told me that you can be in jail for three years, four years, nine years, waiting. For, you know, whatever happens to this idea of the speedy trial. Meanwhile, you're not getting better treatment. You're in there with everybody else. Everybody's together. No one tells you that until you go to jail. You find out, oh, everyone is punished. There is no such thing as the innocence until proven guilty. It's I'm too poor to get out of here. And so therefore, I'm going to be punished as if I have, in fact, done whatever you charged me for it, with. So we talk about that. I start writing, though. I start writing first just what I was feeling personally. Like, all right, here's what I'm dealing with. Like, what it, how much I hate myself. How much, I, how much I've hate myself for the things, like, where I am now. How many people I felt like I let down. And I would just write about those things. Then after about three to four days, I realized I ain't going nowhere. Like, I'm not getting out. No one's coming to get me. And so then I started sort of paying attention to what I saw around me. Now, this, I would say, I did in a, in a kind of a natural way. I wasn't looking to do a study. At this point, I was not, you know, a graduate student. I was just Michael who was in jail. And so I looked no different than anybody else. I wasn't associated with any university. I was just a guy who was incarcerated. And so this is not, of course, what I was planning to do. Now, the night before I went in, the night that I, before I uh, surrendered myself, I had spent maybe the week going into that, like, reading my son and, and enrolling him in school where my mom was and, like, trying to ready my, like, emptying my apartment, doing all of that, which is kind of a surreal thing to do. And one of the professors in there, who I did not know, Ellen Reese, who became a good friend and a, my dissertation chair, she called me the night before. And she's like, hey, pay attention to what you see. And I was like, who is this white woman telling me to pay attention to jail? My life's over with. I don't want to have this conversation with you about, like, you know what I mean? This is not what I'm thinking about right now. I'm, I'm packing because I'm about to go to jail. I might not come out of jail. The last thing I'm thinking about is doing a study here. It's like, I can't wax academic about this. She's like, I know, I'm just telling you. Mind you, we had never had a conversation in the department ever before then. So we didn't have a relationship. So the way she got my number was through another professor who I was friends with. So it just was weird. Like, so it, made me, it gave me the sense like, OK, everybody's just talking about me in this department, which of course they are, right? Of course they are. But I did pay attention. I did sort of focus on the things that were kind of going on. I finished that dissertation. Now, it wasn't easy. I spent a lot of time arguing with her about whether I should do it or not. Um, should I go back to the study about romance and, and interpersonal relationships and try to build something out of that? Um, but in the end, I turned that dissertation into a book. This book I turned, um, just got published last year. And today I want to talk a little bit about one sort of aspect of this. This doesn't really exist as a thing, the sociology of dreams. I know that Gary Allen Fine published something on this uh, once before. There's a few other people. There's an entire journal dedicated to dreams and sleeps called Sleep, but it's not really sociological. But today I want to talk to you a little bit about what I might call the sociology of sleep. So early into my time there, I also started documenting like my dreams and my nightmares. And part of this had to do with the fact that I was having nightmares that I had never had before. 
right? When I, so it's one particular nightmare. I was my, sort of my, I was in my teenage household, but I was grown with my son, and my mother was looking for her bingo dots. And she was like, I need to go to bingo tonight, something she used to do a lot when I was a kid. And I was telling her something bad is going to happen if you go play bingo tonight. Don't go, don't go. And she's like, no, I got to go. So she goes. Now, as she's looking for her bingo dots, I sort of discover my son dead in some water. I'm not sure, if, is it a tub or is it an ocean or where we are, but it's in some water. So I grab up his lifeless body and I'm running out into the night air and I'm crying in the night air. And that's how I wake up with street tears streaming down my cheeks, waking up, but I'm in jail. These types of nightmares I wasn't having before then. I wasn't having any kind of visions like this before then. It's kind of important to remember, like, going back, so again, as a single father, I don't, I mean, let me add this too, because whenever I say I'm a single father, people are like, well, where's the mother? I was a single father. I don't know where the mother was. She was gone, right? So it was all on me. There was nobody else to take my son to, except for my mother, who also wasn't terribly stable at that time. There was a lot riding on my success, and it felt to me in hindsight that all of the problems of my life were being distilled into my dreams and changing the things that I tended to think about. I wasn't having a lot of new information while in jail, right? I'm not watching television every day. I'm not reading a newspaper every day. I'm not on my phone, on Instagram. I don't have a phone, you know what I mean? I'm in jail. So my mind is using whatever is sort of on hand. And what's on hand are these traumatic thoughts and emotions. That's what I'm dealing with. So I start to pay attention and I realize that, okay, all of my dreams are kind of looking like the stuff that I tend to, tend to, uh, tend to sort of reflect what's happening in my life, right? And I realize uh, they sort of touch on these themes. So not immediately, this is something I've done after the fact, after, go after I come home and I start doing an analysis, I realize like, okay, I can code these, these dreams. This is what the coding sort of looks like. And it's not unique to me, I find. Turns out, I'm not the only one. I used to go to this area called, we called church. It'd be like in this room that we called the program room. The program room was literally just, you know, a, a room that you go into with concrete benches. And I know what you think. I don't want to hear. I already know. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. So from a different presentation. It has nothing from years ago now. We'll talk about it later. Um, go to this program room. It's just brightly lit room with concrete. Yeah, see, why, why, why do this? <laughs> with concrete benches. Um, I'll have to share, bring you all in on the joke later on because you can't have, have this moment without. Anyways, so one of the guys there starts talking about the dreams that he's having. And he says, I'm having this dream where, this nightmare where I'm pinned against the wall and there's dogs barking at me and there's serpents striking at me. This is the way he says it, serpents striking, striking at me. And then one by one, everybody else starts to say, yo, I had a dream like that or I'm having a nightmare similar to that. Yeah, I have that kind of dream or I'm also pinned or I'm also being chased or I'm also you know, fighting off some kind of evil spirit, or whatever else. So when I'm, I come to realize, like, this is not something that's unique to me. Even something as intimate as the things that we tend to dream really don't belong to just us. These things tend to sort of cluster together. They tend to, to sort of factor that they're much more social than I thought than, than they are individual. So the types of themes that we have, what, what the sort of the, the general sort of theoretical thrust here is that I'm guessing that the betting that the more cloistered, the, the, the higher the degree of cloistering it is for the organization, the more likely it is that you see people having their dreams start to th clump together in terms of certain themes. So you will find this not just in jails, but in prisons, in hospital residency programs. You'll find it in military academies. You'll find this in police academies. You'll find this like the more, like especially to the extent that you're trying to homogenize a population, you're subjecting them all to the same types of social conditions. You will find time and again that people will have start, start to have similar kinds of dreams. This has been found in other places and other kinds of studies, but this is what I found here. So it's, it doesn't, you won't find the exact same kind of dream, right? You know, the frequency of the dreams that people have, the nightmares they have will change the kind will be sort of clumped along around the kind of uh, social situations in which they find themselves, right? Is it a more traumatic dream? Is it a less traumatic dream? That will depend in large part upon, upon the type of, of organization in which you find yourself. But the fact is the intensity and frequency will be the, the, the true variables here, the thing that we can sort of point to. In jail, most of this was, this is sort of what everything sort of clumped around, right? These issues of shame and loss and fear. But oftentimes I would be, um, some kind of terrible revenge mission. I'd be out like, like searching for somebody who had, I dreamed had hurt my son. Always I was just a little too late. Couldn't quite get there. 
somebody else will share a nightmare. It's like, yo, I'm always being chased by mental health staff, or I'm always being chased by the police every time I go to sleep, or my baby mama is chasing me every time I go to sleep. But always I'm running from somebody or running to somebody, never quite able to get away or get there in time. Right? So everyone's having a similar. Now, we're not all talking about these dreams except for during church, and we don't have church regularly. So it's, you see it in people's sort of bodies right? when we're interacting. So I'm end up having a conversation with, I'm trying to make sure I'm on the same, like this is actually moved over to the, oh yeah, all right, so we're, yeah, okay, good. So I'm in this point where I'm having a conversation with my celly again, and I'm telling him, um, you know, about the times of nightmares I'm having, and he's like, well, I'm, I'm going to mental health. I'm going to get somebody, going, going to get some kind of help. He goes to mental health. Now, I had a previous celly go to mental health and come back, and whatever he was given gave him nothing. He got no support. He felt, he did not feel better at all. Scott goes. And he comes back and he's like, man, I'm not even dreaming at all anymore. Now, if you know me, you know I'm going to speak with confidence, even if I don't know what the hell it is I'm talking about. And I told him that I had read somewhere that we dream always, even if we don't remember it. I have no idea if that's true, right? But I told him as if that was true. So we argued. And he's like, you don't understand. I'm not dreaming at all. So he would go to sleep. It would be almost as if, if you've ever had surgery and you've been put under general anesthesia, you go to sleep, you wake up, you don't, you don't miss the time. But imagine now going to sleep, knowing that you were asleep, having no, like, just emptiness, and then waking up. And that's the way that he described what it meant to go to sleep now. So it was distressing for him. He's like, I'm asleep, not rested, and, like, aware that I'm asleep and not having anything in my mind. Like, my mind's being wiped clean of any kind of thoughts. So my, another gentleman time, uh, chimes in. He's like, well, I don't know about all that. He's like, but I'm so rested that I just am running out of things to think about. He's like, I'll have a dream, or I'll be sitting up, and I'll be daydreaming, and my thoughts will start to just loop. And I'm just, I don't have any new information at all to, to hold on to, right? What I might call a deprivation dream, whether you're awake or asleep. There's another kind of, there's two other kinds of dreams that I stopped having while I was in jail. One, no erotic dreams at all. And we all had what we called, um, actually, the, the name of that material is not particularly important, but we all had magazines that were, that sort of <laughs> cut the, that, that walked the line between like, is this actually porn or not, right? So, because you can't actually have porn in jail. Um, but we, everybody had widely circulated magazines, which is its own kind of issue to think about. Um, something I described in a book, I'll let you all uh, revel in that chapter. <laughs> but, um, but I also wasn't having what I call productive sleep. So right now, when I'm, as most professors I think, when we're working through an idea, for me, I'll noodle with the idea before I go to sleep. And when I wake up, oftentimes I'll have like the next line, or the next idea, or the concept, or another term, another way, something that moves me forward, right? When I was in jail, I had nothing like that, no productive sleep at all. I would just go to sleep, have a terrible nightmare or a terrible dream, and then wake up, and that would be that. The other thing is the environment itself is distressing. It's not just the content of your dreams that are, that are the problem. So in, in this place, note that this is, these are metal slabs that everyone's sleeping under or sleeping on. These metal slabs, you'd have a, um, a mattress, a foam mattress, about two and a half inches thick. So, well, well I'm not a small person. You turn over on that, and that's your elbow, boom, right on the metal. Oftentimes, I'd have um, you know, a shooting pain in one, of my, in one of my legs because I had blood, blood shunted from one of my legs all night long, or I'd wake up with a pinched nerve in my neck, or I would wake up, my back would be killing me. The lights never cut off in these cells. Under any circumstances, the deputies never, never, never let you cut the lights off. What you can do for some deputies, not everyone, some deputies will allow you to take potato chip bags, splay them open, use uh, toothpaste, and then you can paste the toothpaste uh, and the potato chip bag over the light. But if you're on the top bunk, the light is like right there, right? So if I can reach it with my hand. So if you're on the bottom bunk, you can put, hang the sheet from the top bunk to cover up a little, little bit to cover it and make a tent. But that sheet, you need it because it's cold. And you're not allowed to sleep in your oranges. That's considered to be dirt bag behavior. So you can't just sleep in your clothes, right? But at the same time, you have to make a decision. Do you want to be cold, or do you want to be able to, to, to get some of the light out of your eyes? And it's that bright institutional lighting that you see, like, in these types of buildings, or if you go to a hospital, right? You've all seen this kind of lighting. The other thing is, all the air is shared. So on this side of the wall, there's a vent that's pushing air into, you, into your cell. It's the air from the cell next door. So whoever's stomach is upset, you deal with it. Whatever's happening in your cell, that air is pushed out into the next cell. So every, all the air communicates with all the cells. The lighting is communicating. I hear what people are dealing with in the, in the cell next to me. So it's an terrible sleeping environment, right? You'd wake up and people would be distressed. 
it's not just this type of cell. So this is what I would call like a closed day room or closed um, cell unit where you only have two man cells. And the other side, you have this open sort of day room is what I call it, this dormitory style. And so, and I should say, the only thing that determines whether you end up in one or the other is the racial uh, occupancy in the cell, right, on the bed, right? So what deputies are waiting for is, so for example, if there's two white guys on one, on a, one of the bunks, on two of the bunks there, then they reserve the third bunk for another white person as well, right? So, or the woods, as they were called. So the woods, the blacks, or the Southsiders. So the Southsiders would be anybody who has a, a Latino surname or kind of looks brown, right? Looks, if you look brown enough to the deputies, then you're going to be a Southsider, whether you want to be or not. If you are black American or from, any, from, the, from the entire uh, African diaspora or Asian, then you go with the blacks. And so this will remind you of the, the sort of the social construction of race relations, right? <laughs> the social, the way that that works. But what ends up happening, like which one you go into has everything to do with the racial occupancy. So if you're in a cell with, if I'm in this cell, they're not going to put anybody else in the cell except for somebody who's, who's, who they categorize, the deputies categorize as black. So that's one thing just to be aware of. It also is a reminder that there's nothing different here in security level. I've been in both, right? You don't have to do anything right or wrong to go in one or the other. In the, in the open day room, the lights are on from 4.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. Breakfast is served at 4.30, lunch is served, and this is in all cells, breakfast served at 4.30 a.m., lunch is served at 10.30 a.m., and then dinner is served around 4.30 p.m. So you have this 12-hour forced fasting period between dinner and breakfast. But also, who the hell eats lunch at 10.30 a.m. here in the United States? Almost nobody. So it completely ruins your normal circadian rhythms, right? It disrupts your normal bodily functions the way that we would normally make sense of the world. We actually need to see the rising and setting of the sun as a way of helping to regulate our own bodies physiologically. Well, in these cells, you have no access to natural sunlight. You have a window, but you can see it's covered up. This is how it was in the cells that I was in as well. In the open day rooms, there just are no, it's just walls, right? There are no windows. They're not even pretending like they're gonna let you see the sunlight. So you could conceivably be in jail for months and never see the sun. It just depends on whether they decide to give you recreation time, right? If you don't get rec time, you don't see the sun. When you go to court, you go under the build, under the jail, you go come up out of the jail into the courthouse, you go to court, you come right back out. Like you never know, you never know, you don't have any sense of what's going on in the outside world. This is why you can feel like you are thousands upon thousands of miles away from anything like civilization, even while being in the heart of the city. So the light comes on at 4.30 a.m. and doesn't go off until 10 p.m. Most of the day, there's nothing to do on your bunks. So people just lay all day long on their bunks. You get up, you go eat. If you're raised in a, community, in a household like me, you, you've, heard, you've, you've been told at some point, either be out or be in, right? You keep coming in out this house, you're making my light bill sky high, is what my mom or my grandmother would say, right? Letting out all the heat or you're letting in all the cold, you're letting out all my cold air. Well, similarly, if you're on the bottom bunk, if you're on the bottom bunk, it's cool. Right? You can get on and off the bottom bunk as you see fit. But if you're on the top bunk, the middle and the bottom bunk will tell you, that those two men will tell you, yo, either be on the bunk or don't. Because every time you climb up, you've got to step on someone else's bunk. So now maybe you're dog tired, you want to sleep, but you've got to decide, how long do I want to sleep? How long do I, do I want to be stuck on this bed? So people hold their urine. They hold themselves from going to the restroom in order to stay on the bunk to not offend anybody else going up and down. But the environment itself just becomes its own issue for where you might sleep. In the mornings, most times, people don't talk at all. Instead, you see people stretching, trying to get them, like they're getting their bodies right, right? So you're, you don't even want to have a conversation with somebody. Like, yo, I've slept so bad. Why are you talking to me? It's kind of the, the mood of the day. So this is the sleeping environment. Where's that arrow? Oh, here it is. So now you've got... A, a terrible set of content that, for the things that you're dreaming about, even if you're just daydreaming. You've got this environment that works against you. Here are all the problems that can develop from you. Not all of them, but to say, this is, there's many more. These are the things that poor sleep hygiene independently can put you at risk for. For all of uh, those of us who don't sleep very often, this is what we may suffer. Now, if you, are, you may already have these things which may cause poor sleep hygiene. But independently, interesting studies on, so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to, to have to go and read these, these studies and then to know that I'm sleeping four hours a night, right? It's like, oh, I'm like literally killing myself as a free person. But this is what the jail is, so this is sort of this silent killer that's operating in the jail. Note two things. One, suicide is the number one uh, cause of death in American jails. And you see mood disorders on there. Followed by heart disease, which is also on there. So you see the jail operating as this independent stratifying force, 
right? Something that we don't oftentimes think about, but it becomes its own way of stratifying sleep hygiene in American society. Keep in mind, right, there's, what, 10 million admissions to jails. Some of these people are the same people, but nonetheless, it becomes a major institutional force for stratifying sleep, a new way of thinking about the harms that are done physiologically to people who go in and out of jail, right? That, and, it, and I should also note that it doesn't take long. People who go to jail and who do commit suicide, they, they do it within the first seven days. And they don't do it in those mental health holding cells. They do it in general population. So they're just with everyone else. Right. Aside from the fact of the harm of having to see somebody who's now committed suicide, it's just the issue of being in jail is that traumatizing, that difficult. Interesting study, I forget the name of the authors right now, that shows, and, and if anybody, if you ever talk to anybody who's ever been to jail in a prison, people will choose prison over jail because it's just so much more damaging of a place to be. I'm not shocked at the numbers. I'm shocked that we kind of know these numbers and nothing has really been done. So. I'm having a conversation with sort of a, a high status resident there and I'm telling him about my sleep woes. I'm asking him about what he does and he's like, man, I go to, to mental health. And at some point he tells me, man, everyone does. And I remember thinking like, everyone goes? Because just when I was free, I didn't think, I, I didn't think anyone should go. I wasn't going to, I, didn't, I hated the idea of going to a therapist. It worried me. It worried me about you know, how I was going to understand myself. But now here I'm in jail and he's like, yeah, everyone goes. So I was like, okay. So I kind of felt free, like, all right, well, I guess I could go. So I go. Now, there's three people who work in the jail and as sort of the mental, health, the mental health staff. So there's Dr. Cross. Dr. Cross, very few people wanted to talk to Dr. Cross. Um, he was not anyone's favorite person. Then there was another nurse who was so inconsequential as to not even have earned a name in my book. Like, I can't remember anything about her. I think I might have met with her once or twice. And she was widely uh, known as somebody you didn't want to have a conversation with. And then there was Nurse B. Nurse B was a little bit different. During my first meeting, the way, this, way your mental health meetings would happen is you s submit a kite, just a piece of paper. It could be a t you know, written note on a toilet paper. It could be written on these little blue slips. It could be anything. You give it to a deputy, or you try to. You hope that one of them accepts it. You hope they submit it. If they do all of, if all these things happen, if you submit it to, like, you go through these different checks and balances, and you're able to get the, the kite submitted, then the deputies will call you out at some point, some weeks later, whatever, say, hey, there's a mental health, you know, walker, a mental health check. So you decide whether you want to go. They call you out. They usually bring you in, in twos and threes. And some, so every now and again, there might be four people. You take this long walk through the labyrinth of jail hallways to the mental health holding cells. The holding cells, there were two, side by side. They had phones in them that worked. So if you knew someone's phone number, you could just call home or call this person. Across from the, from the, from the mental health and holding cells, there's a hallway, and then across the hallway, there's like these little booths that everyone's supposed to sit in. So when I get to see Nurse B, the first thing she does, she calls me to the booth, I sit down, she starts talking to me. She's calm. Her affect is like friendly. We're having a conversation about, she like just wants to talk to me about just what it, you know, things I'm experiencing. She's just listening. She says, do you know your release date? I say, no. She tells me my release date, which was interesting because I kind of have forgotten. It's very easy to feel like I'm never going to get out of here. So she gave me my, my release date. That's calming. We talk a little bit about problems around sleep. She says, all right, I'm going to give you, quote, a skill. And she tells me to lay still. And she says, I want you to focus on the muscles in your forehead and then relax them. Then focus on the muscles in your eyebrows and relax them. I'm always like this, right, or like this, dealing in the sun anyways, looking mad when really I'm just trying to get the sun out of my eyes. And so um, for me, so I... This is something I'm, I'm aware of, and I get migraines too. So for me, I'm much more, much more aware of this now. So like, relax those muscles, relax your cheek muscles, and then go down one arm, then the next arm, all the way down to your, you know, to your feet. And she's like, this ain't gonna help you. I can't do anything about the things you, you dream about, but at least you'll get to sleep, you'll be a little more relaxed. And so I was like, all right, well, that, I guess that's something. So that's what she gave me. She said, do you wanna see me again? And it felt like a real, like I had a choice not come back here, you ain't got no damn choice. It was like, do you want to see me again? I was like, yeah. So she stands up. Behind her was this bustling office of people, so I knew I didn't have very much privacy. She stands up, she goes to the booth next to me to the right. The guy in the booth launches into this story about blood and guts and the types of things that he's dreaming about, how he's being drowned in blood, and he's going on and on, and all I can think is, yo, I can hear everything this man is saying. I didn't realize that there was just corkboard between me and him. So what I had just said wasn't just for her or just for the people in the office behind her. It's for whoever else is just around me. That changed what I was willing to share at mental health, right? I'm not willing to tell you my deepest, deepest darkest secrets. 
Right? I can't talk. I can't get treatment here because I can't be honest with you here because I don't. Need, I didn't know that somebody was even in this booth. So this guy's going on. He's not even letting her get in a word in edgewise. She's he's just talking, 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 and her affect never really changes. She's just calm. She just listens. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm a, that man, that, yeah, I can see that's distressing, so on and so forth. She does say finally, okay, well, listen, our time is coming up. It's not long. I felt like we was in there for maybe 15 minutes, not no 45, 50 minute <laughs> session. It's not that, right? And she's not coming to you saying. Last time we talked, we discussed this, you know, how do you feel this? It's not that, and not a follow-up. It's like every time you meet with her, it's brand new. Like, she knows your name, but it's not a, it's, it's a brand new session. Like, as if she got, okay, so tell me what's going on with you. Be like, I just told you this last time I saw you, Nurse B. So he, he finishes up his conversation. She gets up, she goes to the booth to, the, to my left. He's a little less eager to jump into the things, but at some point they start talking about dreams and nightmares also. And he's talking about the problems he's having of this pending court case and the way that's seeping into his dreams and the way that he thinks about his sleep and how little sleep he's getting and now all the, all the issues he's facing in the, in the, the day room because of the race relations and racial politics around where, what he can do and what he can't do. And there's just no answer for any, of the, for any of this. There's no, she can't give him anything. She can't prescribe anything. She can't, you know, her skill that she gives him is not fixing anything. So he just talks about this and I feel distressed listening to him. I don't want to know this. I don't want to know the content of his dreams. Even as I've started to turn my time into a study, this is not personal information that I really want. They send me back to the, um, to the holding cell, and I sit in there, and, and I'm just sort of talking with this guy. He's tall white, he's super tall white dude. I don't know if he knows why we call him Paul, but we all call him Paul in reference to Paul Bunyan because he's that big. And so, but he just accepted being called Paul, and so, which I appreciate because he seemed like this sort of a gentle giant dude. He tells me, he's like, man, I wanted to talk to Dr. Cross or Nurse B, whatever else. He's like, but, you know, it's bad. Like some of the stuff I'm experiencing are kind of bad stuff. He's like, Michael, I appreciate you listening to me because I can't go to Dr. Cross with this stuff. And the dreams that he's having, the nightmares around his wife, his children, the goblins coming and snatching his kids, like really wild stuff that he just is like, I can't, like, I can't focus. He told me he was on 13 medications, which is like, who knows how that, who those things were interacting with the things, the environment itself. But having all of these types of dreams, these types of nightmares, the question I, I sort of come to in the end was, well, why the hell bother go to mental health? Because I would go, and then I would have the meeting with Nurse B or Dr. Cross, who would hardly ever listen to anything anybody had to say. He, Dr. Cross, by the way, his, his advice would usually be like, well, you just need to talk to the people in there. He just seemed to think everybody was reasonable and you could just have a conversation. And people would be like, yo, I can't just tell this guy to leave me alone, right? Like, we're not at the school, we're not on, this ain't, you know, I'm not in the fifth grade. This, du this dude is gonna beat me up, right? Or this person is like threatening me over phone time. This person is extorting me for food. I can't just tell them reasonably, hey, sir, leave me alone, let me just, and I can't just go to the deputies, who, by the way, are working with um, the, the, the penal residents themselves, right? And in, in order to make sure that their work shift is low. Right, they work out. They don't want to have to deal with the people's problems. So let's sort of let the wolves eat themselves. So why go? Well, there's two reasons. I was having, I was building friendships with people who would go to mental health. I was having lots of conversations with Paul, and I would look for a way to get out of the cell. I'd do almost anything to get out of the cell. Most of us would, but there's a level of camaraderie there that you can't get in the housing units. You can't have friends who are cross racial boundaries. So for me to be able to chat with Paul calmly about things that were going on in my life, I liked it. He liked it. We all sort of had these conversations and could build from one another. It was useful. The other thing is I told you there were phones in there. Now I didn't have anybody whose phone number um, wasn't a home number and I didn't have a phone card number memorized. So I couldn't walk into the cell and call, but you would start to see, I started paying attention because the deputy noted this. He was like, ah, oh, I know you're over here. You're just trying to use the phone. And at that point I hadn't realized that people were doing that. But I started paying attention, and you realize people are just beelining straight to the phone. They're not here for a mental health check. But I don't blame them. Like, you know what I'm saying? Here's an opportunity to get out of the cell. So here's an opportunity to make a phone call. This is, this is the, the sources of respite that you can get in jail. You're having, it's not mental health treatment. It's an opportunity to maybe build some kind of makeshift friendship with somebody else who's also suffering, right? Who's also, and we're all having these issues around sleep. We're all having poor sleep hygiene. We're all just looking for some way to sort of endure for a little while longer. This is why in the book I don't talk about 
adaptation, I just talk about endurance strategies because it's all we're trying to do, to do for a little while longer. It's not going to get better. You're not going to fix it. You're not going to become better adapted to it. You're not going to feel like, oh, now, now I got this. You're just going to endure for as long as you can. And you will fail at some point. Building friendships oftentimes is the only way to keep hard time from, step, from lasting as long as it will. So this, these, let me just make one other sort of point here about the issue around mental health. And I'm sometimes asked, like, what do we need to do have, to have better mental health in a jail? And I'm sort of reminded of, like, you know, this idea about um, the, of the master's tools. It's not exactly the same, but, but thinking about what R.G. Lord had to say. But you can't really fix anything in a jail, right? Jails just break things. That's what they do. So you're not going to go to jail and be improved. You're not going to have mental health care in a jail and think that's going to function properly. The people who are doing mental health care don't understand or don't have to deal with the contingencies that people who are in the housing units have to deal with. So you can't help anybody, even if you wanted to. You don't have the resources to help somebody, even if you wanted to. The best you can hope to get is a nurse B, somebody who will listen to you for a little while and talk to you about you know, let you talk about your problems. But you're not going to get treatment. Treatment looked like being thrown in what I call the palace de excreta, that suicide cell, when I first got there. Treatment looks like I, I sat and I had these conversations with these people and then that was kind of it, right? That's treatment. That's mental health treatment in a jail. That's, what, that's how sleep deprivation is, is handled there. Interestingly enough, I've continued this, this work. So in jail, these are the kind of themes that people sort of, that people's dreams and nightmares sort of clump around, right? These issues here. But I've also started studying other kind of groups. I'm finishing up this study of police in a large Midwestern law enforcement agency. <laughs> and they have a similar kind of set of dreams. Always it's like the gun jammed. Now, always rushing to a scene and trying to help somebody and never not, not being able to get there. Or I got there and I have my gun but I don't have a clip in. Or I have a gun, I'm trying to stop somebody and, and a gun jams. Or I'm trying to save this child and I can't get there. I'm trying to get this person out of the car, I can't get them out of the car. It's like always not being able to do the thing that you're trying to do. Preliminarily, also talking with, with nurses and physicians, a similar kind of set of dreams. Right? I'm trying to, particularly with these are OBGYNs and nurses who work in OBGYN wards, trying to get the baby, the baby out, the baby stuck. Like having a recurring dream and nightmare that I cannot do the thing that I am trying to do here. This is stopping me. I'm, something is keeping me from being able to do it. Rarely do they report actually, this actually ever actually happening, right? Oh, they, the baby was a little bit stuck, but I was able to do, do the delivery, right? Most cases, they're able to sort of do just fine. But the anxiety is there enough to shape the types of dreams that they're having. And they're not all having conversations about like, yo, did you have this dream? It's after I poke them a little bit like, yo, so what kind of, what does this look like for you? They're like, yeah, actually I dream this. And then if you put them in groups, I have that dream too. I have a similar kind of, it looks like this. So this, what I'm pointing to is that there's a need then to not just study jails as these organizations or the institutions that, just, uh, that, that punish people, but also to think about the way that they stratify something that is actually kind of a silent killer for all of us, and that's just poor sleep hygiene. All right, I appreciate you all. Your, pay attention. I look forward to hearing your questions. All right, that's about it. We'll take some time for some questions. One quick note, you do need to speak into the microphone. It would seem like the microphone is off, but it is on. I guess my question is um, whether it be towards the you know, end of your incarceration or kind of throughout, did you ever have good dreams or maybe just neutral dreams? I had a dream one time that I was when, um, so on Crenshaw Boulevard, there's this, uh, like just, just uh, south of Slauson Boulevard, on the right, on the, on the west side, there's this school, this fence, this giant fence. And I was dreaming that I was walking up along this fence. And then like while walking along this fence, like I just came to like this like brownstone stoop, right? And I see a bunch of brothers sitting on the stoop and they're all wearing Timberlands. So I just assume, oh, I'm no longer in LA, now I'm in New York, right? Because I just see Timberlands. And they're not talking at first, they're just kind of standing there. And then like in unison, they all hop off the stoop and start dancing. And I hear the keyboard, uh, the, the, the initial keyboard uh, code uh, uh, chords to come and talk to me, the remix. And they all start dancing and it's, as a song is playing. I hadn't heard the song in years. I wasn't, I wasn't listening to that music. And I hadn't, I hadn't even been to New York at that time in my life. So, but they started singing and dancing 
And what ends up happening is they're, they're kind of like they all know the routine. And I had this this feeling of like, OK, I don't know the routine. I mean, I'm, I'm like everyone's looking at me because I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here in the moment. And what I sort of come to understand this is a different kind of deprivation dream. So while some people were having like just recurring thoughts over and over again, my brain was stick -stitch stitching it together like any little piece of information and turning that into a thought. And it wasn't just me. Some people would sing the Cars for Kids jingle over and over and over again. Or they'd be repeating uh, songs from uh, lines from movies. Mark for Death, me and my celly, we used to go, go through that movie over and over. I hadn't seen Mark for Death in probably 20 years, right? So how often are you watching anything? What's that guy's name who's in Mark? Yeah, how long? I hadn't seen a Steven Seagal movie in a long, long time. But he and I would go back and forth about that. Somebody else was singing Rockwell over and over again, right? People are see, like people are putting their, their brains being deprived of any kind of new type. This is like a way of thinking, rethinking what Sykes uh, makes the arguments that, my, that Sykes is making about deprivations. Another type of deprivation, not rethinking, but just like, sort of extending it. So yeah, I had they weren't that wasn't as troubling, right? Oh, I can't, I don't know the dance steps, but it was kind of like this issue of okay, well, I don't have any new information to build a new thought on, right? So when people would send books. It was, I read anything. If you send me anything, I read anything. One of the professors at UCR sent me these three feminist books, and she was like, you can't go nowhere, so just read them. And so, <laughs> which I appreciate. It helped to shape the way that I thought about a lot of different things. So, yeah, you, the, so not every dream is, is quite as distressing, but the issue there is still that I'm not, I'm, there's like this issue of shame because I don't know the dance steps, right? So I would still code it as shame. The degree of shame is different, but shame nonetheless. Uh, thanks for coming out here, Mike, and doing a great job on this presentation. Um, every time I see your work, there's like a new, a new wrinkle that, that comes out. Um, you know, and as long as I've known you, I still haven't heard a lot about these uh, experiences, so I, I really appreciate you sharing. I have a couple questions about uh, sort of main theoretical concept that you're putting forward um, in sleep hygiene. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the ter hi why hygiene and not, you know, an, multitude of other things that could have been. <laughs> right. um, but then also, in terms of the implications of the study, are you hoping to, to like articulate a new branch of theory in sociology? Are you, are you hoping that this has some kind of policy applications later on? Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, those okay. are, that's enough. I got other questions, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I use sleep hygiene because that's what people in, in the medical community call it. It's called sleep hygiene. So. Um, and as somebody who goes to a sleep therapist, they call it sleep hygiene, right? I don't listen to what she tells me to do, unfortunately, but I should. <laughs> and like, she does know more than me, I just don't listen. But, um, so they call it sleep hygiene, so I just do. I didn't try to invent something new for sociology, for social science. The other thing, though, is that, so I don't know that I'm hoping for anything. I discovered this going back through the analysis while I was writing the book. And I realized, like, oh, yeah. So when I'm going through ethnographic data or qualitative data, I line item code everything. Like I'm just, I read it over and over and over again. So each paragraph may have three or four different codes, right? Any interaction we're having. So this could be, like what we're doing here, it could be understood as um, like professional clients, right? To the extent that you are not clients and I present myself as a professional in this area or just a normal conference talk or just, you know, any number of other things, right? You can think of different ways to, so we would code this as this, just our interactions however we want. So when I was doing that, that's when I sort of realized this is a pattern here to all that. Whenever I like dream, here's what I dreamed, right? Or like, you know, nightmare, here's what I had, or this person talked about this. So I was like, okay, there's actually something to this. And I remember us having many, many conversations about sleep. In terms of policy, it seems obvious. Like this, to me, there's not, there's not a lot of things that you, that this, this, it's not that difficult. One thing people could decide to do is get rid of this ridiculous time in which we're fed, right? We don't have to feed people on this ridiculous schedule that ruins their circadian rhythms. You don't have to do that. It's also not, a, it's not necessary to make it so people don't have any access to natural sunlight. It just, it, the punishment is supposed to be, like in its most bland form, that you've been removed from society. Not you've been removed and now when you go to jail, now the punishment really begins. It's not supposed to be that, but that's what it is. But in doing that, now we're creating something new. It's not just that you've gone to jail and you've lost all the social capital that you would have had for the time that you were incarcerated. But now this is a new form of inequality that we're building into, into society, right? People are going to, to, be, to come out for the worse, physiologically, something that we can actually measure. It's an interesting study that I'm trying to propose. We'll see if I can get it off, get it going. 
well, I'm interested in, in getting um, cortisol measurements at different times, right? And then like linking that up with qualitative interviews. So asking people what they're dealing with and also like measuring the stress levels as they go, having conversations about their sleep, their mental, uh, mental well-being and so on and so forth. So I have, we'll put to we'll a C, it's gonna have to include me and a bunch of other like scholars in order to do it all. But um, everyone I've talked to about this, like, yeah, let's do it. We'll see if we can actually get it off the ground. But um, yeah, the jails themselves, they create a new type of issue. So it, it's good to just sort of be aware of that. Yes. Leaves a microphone over there. Thank you so much for sharing it. It's quite eye-opening mm -hmm. in like church. And I was wondering if there was any um, thoughts about doing something comparative hmm. to see like systems in other countries. Right. Uh, for me, I haven't started looking internationally first um, yet. I'm starting off just with organizations and institutions here. So this is one of the things. So the study that I'm doing with the police wasn't explicitly about jail. I mean, about sleep hygiene, but neither was the study in jail. But I, after having conversations with a few officers who talked to me about the nightmares they have, then I started asking all of them. I, I, I forced that question into there. Somehow we, start, we have a conversation about this. Or there's been one conversation I had in which an officer, um, his wife was there, and she was talking to me about the nightmares. Because he, he wasn't telling me anything. She was like, yeah, he sleeps awful. Here's the kind of dreams he's having, especially after a hard night. So I started the, 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 the research that I've can sort of preliminary stuff I've done, the interviews I've done with nurses and physicians is explicitly looking for issues around sleep. I'm looking there now. So the comparison is really across these different types of professions. I'm betting that professors have something else too. I don't know what it would look like. The degree of cloistering is different, right? We're not all, like we're not homogenized and, and grad school doesn't build like one kind of scholar, but we all have a, a similar kind of set of anxieties. So it may not be that we have the same type of nightmares. Maybe we do. Maybe you dream that your slides don't work or that you have to export them to PowerPoint because you don't, no one has <laughs> keynote. Maybe you do that. Or maybe it's just that you have a lot of anxiety and it makes, it drives you to do, a, do research in a particular kind of way always worrying, not sleeping as much. So what the patterns look like will, will largely be based upon the, the kind of pressures that that profession you know, puts on uh, the members. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> um, fascinating stuff, primarily because of the scholarship, but also any talk that could work in. Jodeci's come and talk to me is uh, I'm a big fan of. So thank you for representing. Points for even knowing that, right. Thank you for representing for the 80s. <laughs> um, Towards this notion, so, so my question, which I'm still formulating, so apologies for starting off with a comment. Um, well, you're an academic. It's what we do. So, <laughs> so this notion of, of um, profession-specific anxiety dreams remind mm. me uh, of, a, of a recurring dream I've had for quite some time mm. where the context changes, but essentially all I have to do in my dream is shout mm. to alert someone to some kind of danger and the problem would be solved. And in my dream, I can't, right? Mm. Like it's to the point where every now and then like, in my sleep, I'll scream and wake my wife up and kind of tell her, like, yeah, <laughs> it's this damn dream again. Um, whenever that happens, like, there's always something going on, either mm. personally or professionally with me that's causing me some, some stress and anxiety. Right. So my question for you is, uh, you, you make a compelling case for s improving sleep hygiene as a policy solution. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any implications in the reverse, right? So if these dreams do pop up for someone, is that for lack of a better term, like an early warning system that suggests maybe some more hmm. mental health treatment or visits are necessary? Or have you considered, again, like how this may yeah. operate in the reverse? Yeah, so I've been, I've been thinking through these, these issues and trying to figure out like what is the, what's the relationship between them all. So one of the slides I showed you with all the different things that are related to poor sleep hygiene, those things are independent factors, and then those things are also like compounding factors. So it's e extremely complex, right? So poor sleep hygiene, obesity, high blood pressure, hypertension, like, so, like all these things are related, but so one sort of causes the other, the other one causes the one, right? So unpacking that is a little bit difficult. For me, it's less about trying to develop a sort of kind of causal model of like what comes first, and more so just starting off with like, okay, these things are related. There is a relationship between the type of pressures that you experience in one profession and the type of sleep that you get, the nature of your sleep hygiene. Going forward, it probably would be something like, the, to answer the question more thoroughly, it probably would require a different type of study than what I'm already doing right now. But it doesn't mean it's not something I'd like to do. I would absolutely would love to do something like that. I don't necessarily know that I need to do it in a jail. I don't really have, I don't enjoy going back to jail to talk to people. I don't, I don't really have, have anything at all to do with it if I could. But um, but there are a lot of different ways that we can go about thinking about the degree of cloistering and sleep hygiene. So there's a lot of other types of studies that could get done. And I, and I do like the idea of thinking about your dreams as an early warning. This is how I started asking other people. 
It's one of the heuristic devices that I use in trying to understand, the, like trying to get through the study. I figure if I'm feeling it, I'm not some kind of unicorn here. Someone else is dealing with this too, right? So the question that, that, um, that uh, Hughes would always ask you, like, you know, if you see it here, you'll see it elsewhere. That's the way that I think about so uh, social science. It's not unique to jail. If it's happening here, this is just one human condition. I will find it someplace else in a different degree, maybe a different frequen uh, frequency, but I will find it someplace else. So I just need to know what I'm looking for. So identifying like, okay, there's a relationship here. That helps me. Now I know to go look for it in, in other places. So the early, in terms of early warning though, yeah, for me it was that. It's like, okay, I'm having these dreams because of where I am. What are, what are other people doing? And I had to go, I should say there's a sort of a clever way. I don't know if it's clever, but it's what I had to do. You have to remember, I'm in jail. Even though I'm writing, I'm doing this study, I'm not actually a scholar. I'm just, I'm just in jail. So I can't go to people like, yo, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to go back to grad school one day. I have no idea if I'm going to get out. I'm not thinking I'm going to get out, in fact. And then when I got out, I worked a bunch of crap jobs thinking this is kind of what my life's going to look like now. I, you know, I manage an oil chain shop. This is what I do, right? B BA in economics and I do this. And so I'm fortunate, right, to have worked hard and take, take advantage of the opportunities I had. But at the time when I was there, I would just broach the subject like this. I would be like, man, I can't. I was like, man, the dreams I'm having are crazy. And I would just say that as a, like a provocation and see who would respond. If they responded, like, yo, I have these traits, boom, we have a conversation. When we go to church, I, don't, I didn't bring up anything in church. People brought their own nightmares and dreams to church. When I go to mental health visits, they did it on their own. I didn't have to. And then we weren't oftentimes having conversations, but when we were, it's because I would broach the subject. Now, I couldn't be known as a busybody walking around and asking people, yo, so what do you dream about? You know, that'll get, that'll get you shunned immediately. But if I have a conversation in which I offer something, people might respond. If they didn't, I left it alone. I'm not going to push. But if they responded, then I chased it down a little bit more. Uh, and this is how I came to understand, in part, that pe everyone was having nightmares, right? Everyone was having the similar kinds of nightmares. So I couldn't, of course, speak to everybody, but enough people to get a sense like this is normal for us. This is normal to the condition of being in jail. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's yes. really, really interesting. I have maybe a, just a question. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed that you are actually able to produce your dissertation. Mm. Uh, so I'm just also thinking about like the practical aspects. Mm -hmm. Like you took notes, but it was not weird that you were taking notes. Could you yeah. keep your notes somewhere? I just kind of wonder how that works. Oh, absolutely. So I did two things. One, I had um, Professor Ellen Reese, who's still at UCR. I would, she visited me, right? She actually came, she put $20 on my books. Um, and I used that money to buy paper. You buy paper and a golf pencil, legal pad. So I wrote always. And so I only wrote when I was in my cell or when I was in the open day room, I wrote when I was on the bunk. I never would write just like out in the day room area and just be writing what's going on. That'd be ridiculous to be outside. Like just you, people are doing something I'm like, yo, here's what happened. Right? <laughs> but we also tended to have the same types of conversations. Oh, this is the problem with being deprived of new information, right? You tend to have the same conversations over and over and over and over again. So what I would do is I would focus on what I would call like anchor free. I have no idea if this is a real thing, but this is the way that I did it. I had to sort of feel my way in the dark for a lot of this, right? I, didn't, I hadn't done an ethnography before, you know, up to this point. So I focus on what I call like anchor phrases. So we had this full conversation. I would remember to be sure to remember one thing that really anchored the entire conversation, like one or two things, like you said this, I said that. And then everything else I would try to cap this, capture the spirit of. Most conversations weren't these long discussions. It was just like a brief exchange. So when I'd be in the cell, I had, uh, and I'd be in the cell more than, more than anything else, I had a lot of time to write. I had a lot of time to go over the conversation that we had, that we will have again. When we come out, we'll have yet again. So I wasn't lost in that regard. The, so I would send stuff to, I'd mail letters and sometimes mail data back to Ellen Reese. I would also send some stuff to Scott Brooks. I would send some stuff to Edna Bonacic, who retired at that point. And, and I would send stuff to my mother. To my mother, I didn't send stuff about research because uh, she was less concerned. Like she didn't, sort of, I don't think she would have understood like how important, like don't lose this letter. When I came home, they also gave me those letters back. So Ellen was like, hey, here you go. I visited Edna. She's like, here go your books. Jane Ward, the, the feminist scholar who gave me the book. It's like, here's, here's the letters. I wasn't asking for them. It didn't even occur to me. But they knew, being senior scholars, like, hey, you're going to need this stuff. The, 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 the notes themselves, I kept under my mattress in the bunk. I knew that deputies could come in and toss the cell and just tear everything up and throw it away. So sometimes on the, on, we knew that they were going to toss the cells on Sundays. On Sundays, I put my, my, uh, my letters inside my books on, that I had, I had like three or four books at this point. So I put them inside the books. 
and I would just hope, like, man, hopefully they don't tear these books up. I got to know the deputies, the ones that I could know. There's one I called Deputy Brown. I, I got to know him. He would say, oh, the writer, how you doing? Right? So I told other people in there that I was writing. Everybody said the same thing. Man, I could write a book about this place. I could tell you about the paint on the walls. I could tell you. So no one felt like I didn't, I didn't produce my, I didn't sort of present myself as I'm here to just study you all. I'm here too. Right? But I'm also, you, you know I'm writing as a way of sort of getting through my time here. Some people did push-ups. Some people wrote. Some people did nothing, right? So it just depends. So that's what I did, and it was sort of a way of sort of surviving. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe one last question. Oh, lucky me. Uh, <laughs> glad to get included. Thank you for just a fascinating talk. I am not a criminologist. Mm -hmm. I teach. Is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I don't it's for the online people. Okay. Uh, I, I teach the sociology of work. Mm. Uh, and I, it just happens that um, I had just assigned a paper about. Um, uh, dreaming of coding mm. uh, by a, a programmer mm. uh, from the New Left Review, uh, and uh, he talked about the dreams he had where he was actually working out coding problems mm -hmm. in the dreams, actually waking up and figuring, having figured out how to solve a coding problem. I guess that's what you call yeah, noodling in a way, yeah. but it was mm -hmm. very specific for him, and he argued that that was a form of, you know, subsumption to the workplace, mm. that the workplace had finally just conquered his mm. entire consciousness. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it made uh, the class wonder, you know, what are what's the room for resistance here? What's mm. the room to intervene in the dream to get space between the human and the institution when, you know, the institution seems to have captured the unconscious, right? right? So I wonder if, um, you know, like, uh, you, I, you talk to, to a lot of people about their dreams. I wonder mm. if that kind of conversation can affect dreams or, or if you saw, like, different kinds of functionalities in dreams uh, where people, yeah. like, I dream of escape or dream of how to solve mm. a, a particular problem from jail. Right. Um, or if there's a possibility of, you know, some kind of intervention to, you know, uh, make dreams a different way, to, to shape mm -hmm. dreams. So, no. <laughs> Thank you. So to all of those, no. Uh, so part of, part of the issue is that um, you're not asking this question explicitly, but there's like an implicit connection that, that, to a question I'm asked all the time. It's about resistance. Resistance is, a, is an incorrect way of thinking about what people do in jail. So when I think of resistance, I think of, to the extent that I, the way that I think about it is, you are aware of the pressure and the controls that are placed upon you by this institutional organization, and you are actively fighting against those for, largely for like, like somewhat political gains. But what you get in jail instead is people just trying to survive, like just trying to endure. There's very little space in jail to change what you're dreaming about, right? There's just no place to go for that. Now, it doesn't mean that people are walking around stoic. We had a lot of conversations, and particularly in the cells, you have like really deep emotional conversations about your family. But the content is the content, right? The circumstances are the circumstances, and they were unchanging. If anything, they felt like they got worse as the days went on. And so you never got a chance to just feel relief, to feel like, I should say, there was one kind of uh, variation. There was one gentleman who said to me, <laughs> to me and Scott one time, he was like, y'all don't get comfortable? He's like, and anyone like this, he's like, you don't just turn over and get comfortable? And me and Scott were like, well, hell no. Who the hell gets comfortable in here? Like, no, it's uncomfortable in here. You know, that's the point, don't get comfortable. But he's the only person I ever met who was like, yeah, I just sleep comfortably sometimes in here. But then you have a conversation with him about his daughter, or in his, his brother, and he was distressed, and he would talk about the dreams and nightmares he would have around them. And so I don't know that there's a, you know, it would be easier if you could get more rec time. It's not really a good reason to not give people more rec time, right? Have more time to, to read in a library if they had a library, the jail didn't have one. If they had one, it wasn't available. If there's other things you can do. I'm already not outside, right? I'm locked away, so you won. So you, you, you don't really need to do all of this also. So there are interventions that could be put in place, but then we would have to have a very different set of values. You'd have to look at people and not, and not say, you deserve more punishment because you're here. As one deputy said to me, if you did something, if you're here, you definitely did something because of course, the criminal justice system never gets anything wrong, right? And so if, you, if that's your assumption, well then you can treat people however you want. 
right? One of my cousins is a correctional officer in Northern California, and he said during training, he was told, everybody in here either has HIV or is trying to kill you. Well, if those are the ways, if that's the lens through which you understand people who are incarcerated, why would you offer anything to sort of, you know, remedy the, the, the difficulties they face? In fact, you're going to think they deserve even more, right? So where do you find spaces to do this? You're not going to change your dreams, but at least having waking conversations with other people, it was like kind of the only kind of respite that you can get in many cases. Or going to taking a mental health trip. Even going to court, on the way to court sometimes, it's just like a walk out of jail, and even that was better, even though those were painful trips. Um, not just getting to the court, like at being at the court, but just the trip over there because you're in chains, shackled. It's just, but anyways, it's a whole deal. But there just wasn't many places in the jail in general for relief. It's why I say when you come out, you come out for the worst for sure. It's also interesting why the reason, one of the reasons I think that most people don't talk about it. When I came home, I realized when I had hella cousins who had been to jail, I never had a conversation with any of them about it. Most of my friends, I still not, even as Danny said, we've not, I, I don't talk about this stuff except for in terms of research. Otherwise, this is not the way that I understand myself, right? Those are experiences that I had, not an identity that I have. And so I don't live in that time. But even when I was in that time, where was I supposed to go for relief? Nowhere, you know? Just was what it was. As in the final chapter of the book says, right? It is what it is. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael. This mm -hmm. has been really amazing and I think opened our eyes to a lot of different things. If nothing else, hopefully people will begin to think about sleep as a human right. Absolutely. There you go. See? Yeah. Yes. Uh, but this is really amazing. So thank you for Thank you. I appreciate it.